in North Baptist Church this morning, and we're here to worship God, and I can't think of a better hymn with which to do it than hymn number six, How Great Thou Art. Let's stand together as we sing, shall we please? good to see all of you here this morning. Let's begin our service with a word of prayer. Pastor Aaron, if you would, please, sir. Lord, we are here to praise you. We are here to praise you. We are here to thank you for uniting us around the cross, uniting us around the great salvation that you have bestowed upon us. God, as we continue in the service, we worship to you, Lord, and praise you with every portion. We praise you with the proclamation of the word. Lord, that we would be active listeners, ready to change. Amen. You may be seated. As you're being seated, though, keep your hymn book handy. Turn to hymn number 448. 
before the throne of God above. Now the choir has sung this piece, so they may have an advantage over you, but you may know it as well, others may not at all, but it's a wonderful hymn to sing together. So you're gonna remain seated as we sing 448 before the throne of God above. choir sings, I'd like to read to you out of the book of Revelation, chapter 7, starting in verse 9, the Bible says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen.
Thank you, choir. We appreciate that. I want to welcome you all this morning to North Baptist Church. Certainly a privilege to have all of you here this morning. Certainly if this is your first time here, it is uh, indeed an honor for us that you're worshiping with us this morning. And if you would take a look at the information you received at the door and fill out that card in just a few minutes and drop it in the offering plate, we would certainly appreciate that. But we're glad all of you are here today to worship with us. Very quickly, by way of announcements, I hope you'll be here this evening for our evening service at 6 o'clock, and we will be having a baptismal service following right after that, so we hope that you can come for that this evening. Then you can see everything else that's happening in our bulletin this week. One thing I do want to let you know is next Sunday morning, we will be recognizing uh, graduates in a special service, so I hope you can be here for that. I uh, also want to let you know uh, regarding our uh, building program, we are about 99.9% .9 done with the building itself, and we'll be having a dedication service here in, in a couple of weeks. We'll let you know about that. The uh, weather permitting, we will be pouring asphalt or laying asphalt next week on the new parking lot. So uh, uh, we, are, uh, we were at a point where we couldn't see the tunnel, let alone the light at the end of the tunnel. Praise the Lord, now the light is shining very brightly. We are just about done, and we are very, very grateful for that, and we certainly appreciate your patience. We appreciate your generosity, and uh, we will be utilizing that new area. Uh, I actually already have, and we're going to go full force here very soon. Uh, that's it as far as announcements for me. Aaron's got a couple, if you would, please. Well, as June starts very, very soon, uh, tomorrow, I believe, correct? Wow. Uh, we're looking at the summer, and uh, the first thing that uh, I've been working on is Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School uh, will be from June 17th through the 20th. We have a flyer out there in the track rack. You'll be able to see uh, the times. It's from 6 to 8 each evening. It's a Wednesday through Friday. And then that Saturday, we typically have a... Uh, carnival type activity here at the church but what we're going to do this year is we're actually going to Elms Park weather uh, permitting and we're going to have a cookout there and um, our theme for this year for Vacation Bible School is the Amazing Grace Race and we are going to uh, have a wonderful race a relay race out there at the park along with a lot of great things for that Saturday so uh, Vacation Bible School uh, for the ages of five all the way to sixth grade if you're coming out of the sixth grade and going into seventh, you can still come, okay? So we'd love to have you uh, come out for Vacation Bible School. Be inviting your friends. We will pass out uh, during Truth Trackers and other opportunities flyers for you to hand out to your friends and family. But that is once again June 17th through the 20th. Also, coming this July, we are going to camp. Uh, we are taking the uh, junior age, the third through sixth grade, and then the seventh through ninth grade up to Camp Kobiak. And uh, then we're taking the 10th through the 12th to Alpine Ministries. Every year we try to raise funds to help offset the cost for going to camp. This year, as of this morning, I got two more registrations in, we have 43 kids going to camp this summer, which is, I believe, over double what we typically do. And that's wonderful, amen? A lot of kids wanting to go to camp. Uh, the other swing of the pendulum, though, is the fundraising uh, events that have taken place. We have, that money needs to go to 43 campers now, uh, which causes, uh, uh, definitely we offset their cost, but it's not typically what we're able to do for each individual camper. Um, as I said, we typically have 40, we are having 43 go this year. The total camp cost for all 43 campers is $11,500. That is how much it costs. That's the total bill. We have fundraised uh, up until this point. We have raised over half of that. We're um, just over 6,000. Um, but that still leaves a significant chunk uh, for the families. There's one family in our church that if they were to pay for all of their kids to go to camp full price, it'd be almost $1,500. Uh, for that one family. So we are having, at the end of June, I believe it's June 24th, we are having another meal uh, to help raise money for the teens. And also throughout June, we are continuing our kids' coins. 
those, uh, those contributions that you make really, really help the parents of our church. Also, we have a number of kids from the community going to church this year. Uh, excuse me, going to camp this year. And um, for some of the, those families, sending $25 is more than uh, those families can handle. So um, we're, we're just letting you know the status. And uh, if you're wondering how much camp is actually going to be after all the fundraising, we won't know until July. So at that point, we'll let you know the exact price. But um, camp, VBS, a lot going on this summer, and I'm just excited about it. So. Thank you, Aaron. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you have a Bible school meeting tonight at 5 o'clock? Yes. Um, 5 o'clock in the uh, double classroom in the expansion. Okay. Thank All right. Yep. If you're going to help with Bible school or you want to help with Bible school, 5 o'clock tonight back in our new... Uh, the largest Sunday school room we have all the way back through on the far right. Now that you have heard that, this is your opportunity to get at your pennies and nickels and dimes and quarters and help our kids with our kids' coins and help them uh, make it more affordable to go to camp. So I'm going to ask our young people if they would head to the back and get a, uh, a bag there. They're going to come around and collect your change to help them go to camp, all right? Ladies, if you would, please. up to the front drop them here oh we got big money sitting over here come on we don't leave any money oh somebody missed this whole aisle over here that's it that's it all right kids bring those bags up to the front we'll drop them in the uh, basket here the ladies are playing everybody ought to know and I think we all know that one so let's sing it together all right everybody ought to know Everybody ought to know, everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Everybody ought to know, everybody ought to know, everybody ought to know who Jesus is. that I'm not one of those families that pays fifteen hundred dollars but uh, we're right up there so anything that you can do to help the, 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 the folks in the church get the kids to camp we certainly appreciate that gentlemen if you would please come and we're going to have our morning offering and again if you're visiting with us if you would uh, uh, drop that information card in the uh, offering plate we would sure appreciate that Russ good to have you back if you would please sir
him guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Thank you very much, Joyce. And as the choir joins you in the congregation and those going to junior church, uh, leave on the next hymn. Let's sing hymn number 33, Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. 33, please. Shall we stand? the Lord ye heavens adore him praise him angels in the night sun and moon rejoice before him praise him all ye stars of light praise the I've done before, so I ask that you forgive me, but this was a uh, request from uh, a dear lady uh, here in the church. She said, next time you sing, will you sing this? And I said, okay. So I do what I'm told. When a lady tells me to do something, I do it. So I hope you'll bear with me. Constant friend is 
For the message, you all know that just a couple weeks ago we finished memorizing John 14, 1 through 6. Well, I want you to know we weren't the only group. Madeline, would you like to tell us what's going on? Here? This is a four and fives uh, class. Come on, guys, line up right here. And they learn verses throughout the month, and I have them for the month of May. And this month, you are learning John 14, 6. So we are going to try to learn it here. We're going to try to say it for you here. So we're going to try to get it properly loud and just bear with us. But they know it really, really well. Let's just get to the microphone. Okay. 
John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Nobody, nobody, no. Shh. 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 We're going to do that one more time and you're going to do it loud for me, okay? I want to really, 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 really loud, okay? John 14, 6. I am the way. The truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. Thank you, kids. We appreciate that. Next week, they'll be singing Handel's Messiah. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1, please. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, young people. Colossians chapter 1, we are going to continue in our series on being completely under God. We talked for a while about being one nation under God. Now we're talking about being one kingdom under God. And today I have a question for you regarding the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And the question is very simple. Is Jesus Christ your Savior and your Lord? Colossians chapter 1, let's start in verse 15. Colossians 1, verse 15, the Bible says, speaking of Jesus Christ, it says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Heavenly Father, how I pray today, this, this message is geared toward your children. And so God, I pray that your children today would have open hearts and open minds to what thus saith the Lord. And fathers, we're going to see today there is a significant difference between you simply being our Savior and you being our Lord. God, how I pray that you would be both to each and every person in this room. Have your will and way in this preaching time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, before we asked Him to forgive us of our sins and to uh, cleanse our heart and to uh, take up residence within us, we belonged to the kingdom of the devil. We belonged to the kingdom of the world. But when we asked the Lord to be our Savior, He divinely transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of heavenly light. Now, believe it or not, that does not sit well with Satan. And he's going to do everything in his power to get you back into his kingdom. Pastor, are you saying we can lose our salvation? Absolutely not. What I am saying is that we can be so blinded by the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and the things that this world has to offer that all of a sudden we are not so concerned with the things of the Lord. We're more concerned with the things of ourselves and more the, the things of the world. And all of a sudden, we are no longer servants in the kingdom of lightness and, and of light in the Lord Jesus Christ, but we are now uh, back to our old uh, self serving the devil. Now, how does that happen? Well, it's very simple. It's, it's something as simple as we come in here on Sunday and take part in, in this uh, divine institution called the church, but then Monday through Saturday, we go out into the world and take part in it. We come in here on Sunday morning and, and we study God's Word. But then Monday through Saturday we go out and we are studying the world. And before we know it, before too long, we have switched kingdoms. We can, we can become 
to the point where we are so far backslidden in our Christianity that people might look and say, which kingdom are you in? And, and, and the thing is, the devil today is ruling over the lives of Christians. And it's not because he has the authority to do so. Remember we talked a couple weeks ago about the devil has a lot of power, but he has no authority. The problem is, you and I, when we, not, when we don't recognize what kingdom we're in and who our king is, which Colossians 1 just told us that Jesus Christ is the supreme ruler over everything, before too long we have, we have backslidden so far where we have basically yielded over authority to the devil in our lives. But the Bible tells us not only in this passage, but with the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his ascension into heaven, he is supreme ruler over everything, including his children. And, and he is in charge. And when we ask him to be our Lord and Savior, we are hopefully, voluntarily submitting to his will. His headship, his kingship, his leadership, his rulership. Just as when Jesus Christ left heaven to come to this earth, he voluntarily submitted to his Father's will. That is what you and I, as, as kingdom followers of Jesus Christ, that is what we're to do. We are to submit to his leadership. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, when he died, you died with him. And when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, you rose with him. And when Jesus Christ ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father, you and I are there sitting with him. And we're going to explain that in, in just a little bit. But in order for you and I as Christians to fully understand and realize the, uh, the leadership, the headship, the kingship of Jesus Christ, we must be willing to submit every part of our lives to him. You know, an individual can go to all the church services they want. They can read the Bible as many times as they want. They can name whatever they want. They can claim whatever they want. But until they submit to the Lord Jesus Christ and His headship over their life, you will never truly realize nor understand what Jesus Christ has in store for you. His destiny for you, His will for you, His plans for you, His blessings for you. We won't recognize that until we completely submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the great thing is, we talk about how, how difficult it is sometimes to fight the world and to stay into God's divine kingdom instead of living for the devil and living for the world. God has appointed to us as his children what's called an intercessor. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is always interceding on our behalf. Whenever the devil goes to God and says, I saw the pastor screwing up again, you need to deal with him. He's a sinner, you need to deal with him, God. Jesus is there and saying, the devil might be right, but I've already covered his sin. He's forgiven, he is your child. And, 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 and if I can say something, just calling on God in order to be a successful Christian is not enough. You must have an active and vibrant and committed relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Go over a couple of pages. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. And this, this verse is, might be kind of strange for some of you. Ephesians chapter 2 and look at verse 6. Ephesians 2, I take that back. Let's start in verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened or made us alive together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know... Just calling on God is not enough. We must have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ where we submit to His will. And then the Bible says here that we are seated with Him in the heavenly places. Now, what on earth does that mean? I'm living here on earth. How can I be seated in the heavenly places? How can I be in two places at one time? In other words, how can I be living in this nasty world we live in 
but with a heavenly perspective. How can I be in two places at one time? You know, just the other day, I was talking to one of our missionaries who was in the Middle East in Jordan. Technology is fascinating. That I can be sitting here in Flint and my voice is in Jordan. But not only that, if, if you are on the computer a lot and you have family or friends that are far away, you will often Skype, right? If you have that computer program, which allows not only my voice to be over, but my face can be seen in Jordan too. If that missionary is using Skype on the computer, I'm using Skype on the computer, I can be sitting in Flint, but my face and my body and my surroundings are live in Jordan. I can be in two places at one time. Technology is amazing. And if man can make it so that we can be in two places in one time, do you not think for a second that God, the creator of the universe, can have us be in two places at one time? What is God saying here when he says we are seated in the heavens? <clears throat> and when we die with Christ, we're raised with Christ, and we're seated with Christ, what all does that mean? It's very simple. If Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior, and if we recognize that we are to serve under his kingdom, even though we're living physically in this sinful world, we're going to operate spiritually from a divine, heavenly perspective. That's only possible when we submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. And what are we submitting? Well, we're submitting our actions, our attitudes, our perspective, our thoughts, our choices, many, many things. But every now and then, there is a disconnect between the king and his servants. How does that happen? You know, we, we, we want to have this relationship with with the Lord Jesus Christ, but every, every now and then there is a, a disconnect. If you ever watch television and you have a satellite dish, you know exactly what I'm talking about, where you are watching the big game or you're sitting down to watch a good show and there happens to be a storm coming through your area and it gets right in the middle of your television and the satellite dish. And all of a sudden you see these words come up that say what? Lost signal. Searching for signal. Now that's frustrating. Because what you're wanting to see, you can't see. You've already paid for it, but something's going on. There has been an interruption. Folks, a lot of times that's what we have in our Christian life. How can I be here on earth physically, but <clears throat> operating from a divine perspective and how I'm supposed to live my life uh, heavenly? Then all of a sudden there's an interruption. It's not when you're watching television, it's not that you don't have the access. You do. Something has come in and gotten between you and your satellite. Folks, how many times in our Christian life when we're trying to do what's right and we're trying to live right, <clears throat> something comes in and interferes with our lines of communication with the Lord Jesus Christ? If we are going to serve the Lord in spirit and in truth, then we must recognize that Jesus Christ is not only our Savior, He is our Lord. There is a huge difference. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But how do we keep these lines open to heaven so that we can live right down on earth? It's very simple. We've talked about the leadership and the headship and the kingship of Jesus Christ. If you and I want to keep the lines of communication open, we are to confess the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> I'm not talking about, Father, forgive me for I have sinned, confession. I'm not talking about that at all. What is a confession? It is an open and public admission and declaration of where you stand on a particular item or issue. We're going to see a lot of that in the next few months with our politicians. <clears throat> They're going to stand up and tell you what they, where they stand on a particular item. And then in two weeks, they'll turn around and change completely and say, I stand on something different. But if you want to have a successful Christian life under the kingdom of Jesus Christ, you will not be afraid to publicly confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is my Lord, my Savior, my King. He is the head of my life and I'm going to submit completely to His will. Everything that I am, I am going to submit completely to Him. 
Jesus Christ, you are my Lord, you are my Savior, you are in charge. We just read, in all things, he might have the preeminence. He expects to be first, and that's where we need to place him. We need to openly and publicly confess him. We need to have a commitment in our relationship with him. But look, if you will, at Matthew chapter 10. The Bible gives us a very clear warning here. Look at Matthew 10 and starting in verse 32. <clears throat> Matthew 10 and look at verse 32. In this chapter, chapter 10, Jesus Christ is talking about how much he cares for his disciples, how much he's going to watch over them and protect them. But look at what he says in verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. You know, it is easy for us today in our society to say that we believe in God. Do you believe in God? I believe in God. Do you believe in God? I believe in God. God's so good. God is good all the time. Well, folks, I hate to tell you, but the world has taken God's holy name and used it in such perverse and abominable ways in our society today that the name God, unfortunately, means very little in our society. But when you confess Jesus Christ, now that means something. And the whole world knows that you've just stepped on dangerous ground because you have confessed the Lord Jesus Christ. You are saying, I, when you talk about Jesus, you are implying that you have some sort of a relationship with Him. It might be kind of like a, a married couple who, uh, in their wedding, they have a, a time where they exchange wedding rings. And the preacher will wax eloquent about the ring is a symbol of this and the ring is a symbol of that and so on and so forth. But the ring is, is uh, among other things, something very important. It is an indicator, a signifier, a marker that I am involved in a binding and legal relationship with someone else. And I want the world to know that I have a relationship with that person. That wedding ring is a confession. It's where I stand on my marriage. And I want the world to know that I'm married. There are some people today, and you and I may know them, where they may be married, but they don't wear their ring. Because they don't want people to know that they're in a relationship. When we look at Matthew chapter 10 and verses 32 and 33, I think we need to be very, very careful because I think there's a lot of Christians today who are part of the bride of Christ. Jesus Christ is our groom. When we accept him as our Savior, we become part of the bride of Christ. But I believe there are a lot of Christians today that don't want it publicly known that they are part of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because we will not openly and publicly confess Him. We will not uh, declare that He is our Lord and that our words and our thoughts and our actions and our deeds and our perspectives are going to be tempered by what thus saith the Lord. We don't want anybody to know. It, it, it may not behoove us, in our own opinion, to claim that we have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now certainly no good standing Christian would do that. Peter did. Peter didn't do it once. He did it three times. He did not want the world to know that he was in a covenantal, divine relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Another way to put it. Peter was okay with Jesus Christ being his Savior. Peter was not okay with Jesus Christ being his Lord. He would not publicly confess it. You know, 
when you and I confess the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord. Believe it or not, Jesus wants to know how we're living our lives. Because if we are living under submission to His kingdom and His kingship, Jesus Christ looks at us because He takes that very, very seriously. To the point that he says in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, if you will confess me before men, I will confess you that I have a relationship with you before my Father. But if you will deny me, then I'm going to deny a relationship with you. You know, again, we talk about this thing. Just having a uh, claiming we know God, that's just not enough. Because Satan believes in God. So in that situation, just... Believing in God gets us no further. It is having an open relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ in word and in deed. God is very excited, and so is His Son Jesus Christ, when we openly express our love for Him and our desire to be like Him. And Jesus will do everything He can to make sure that the lines of communication are always open between us and God. He's going to make our way clear as best as he can. The best way to explain this is for those of you that are football fans, you know that you have the quarterback, and right behind the quarterback is the fullback, and right behind the fullback is the halfback. What's the difference between a fullback and a halfback? The fullback is usually much bigger, much stronger, and much slower. But his job, as soon as the ball is snapped, his job is to run right through the line and open up a clear path so that the much faster halfback, when he gets the ball, can run right through to glory and get the touchdown. That fullback's job is to do nothing more than to block and to run interference for so that the enemy cannot tackle the halfback. And folks, can I tell you, if you will allow me to, Jesus Christ is your fullback. He is always blocking the devil so that you and I never have lost signal. Jesus Christ is always blocking for you so that you will have no reason whatsoever not to confess him as your Lord. But you know what's interesting? When the fullback does his job and the halfback just waltzes right through, he gets the touchdown, he gets the glory, he gets on television, he's the one that does his happy touchdown dance, and everybody talks about how great the halfback is, and there sits the fullback. Folks, can I tell you something? If I were that fullback, I'd sometimes kind of feel like, you know, I just got used for my power. I just kind of got taken advantage of for my power. I just made the way clear so that that halfback can go in and get all the glory, and yet all I got was taken advantage of. Folks, can I tell you something? I believe in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Jesus Christ is saying, are you taking advantage of me? None of us like to be used. None of us like to be taken advantage of. Where someone else uh, takes advantage of, of our kindness, our abilities, our, our availability, whatever. Whether it's in a relationship, whether it's at home, whether it's at work, whether it's at church. None of us like to be taken advantage of. Folks, I believe Matthew 10, 33 is telling us Jesus Christ does not like to be taken advantage of. When he is running interference from you so that the devil cannot get to you and so that you can have a wonderful relationship with him, Jesus Christ, I believe, says, look, if you are not willing to confess me as your Lord, why on earth should I change your life? Why on earth should I change your world? Why on earth should I give you blessings if you are going to deny me, forget me, or overlook me? If you will not claim me as your Lord, then I just might not claim you before my Father. Folks, that's some scary stuff. <clears throat> Let's see here. You know, 
we're talking about this confessing. Let's look at Romans chapter 10 for a little bit. We're just about done. But look at Romans chapter 10 because it tells us something interesting. Romans chapter 10. Read a very familiar passage here. Romans 10. Let's start in verse 9, if you would please. Paul says here to the church at Rome, starting in verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now we're talking here in this passage about salvation. And in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, the Bible tells us two things we must do. But it's odd because if you go to most other passages in the Bible talking about salvation, it usually only mentions one thing, and that's to believe. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. When Paul and Silas were in the jail, and, 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 and the Philippian jailer comes out in, in Acts 16 and verse 30 and says, What must I do to be saved? Paul said what? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If you go to John chapter 5 and verse 24, the apostle John says the same thing. Believe. But here in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, it says we have to believe and confess. So, one of two things is happening here. Either the Bible, we've just found a contradiction in the Bible, or... Paul is trying to tell us something additional about Jesus Christ. And here's what I believe. Paul's telling us that you must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior so you can get to heaven. But Paul's saying you must also confess Jesus Christ as your Lord so that heaven comes down to you. Folks, we are talking here about the difference between Jesus just being your Savior and Jesus being your Lord and your King. And when we talk about being saved, it's a word that means to be rescued, to be, to be delivered, to be saved from. And I think why we have a lot of Christians today that know they're going to heaven, but they're living a miserable life here on earth, is because they have, con they, they have put their faith and trust in Lord Jesus Christ to forgive them of their sins, but they have not confessed, you are my Lord here on earth. I want you to take me to heaven, but let me control my own affairs on earth. I don't want you to be my Lord. You know, back in New Testament Rome, what was happening is that the Roman magistrates would haul Christians into the courts because they were confessing Jesus Christ as their Lord both in their words and their actions. The word Lord would, would speak of a supreme authority or a supreme ruler. And the Roman authorities were trying to get the Christians to declare that Caesar was the Lord and the supreme ruler. You know, the funny thing is, back in Rome, if, 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 the, if the Christians of the day believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, that didn't get them into any trouble at all. But when they confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord. That's what got them thrown to the lions. Now, the reason that we're seeing today a lack of God's rescue or deliverance or blessings in our, our lives and in our homes and in our churches is because we have positioned Jesus Christ as our Savior, but we have not positioned Him and confessed Him as our Lord. God, I don't want you, I don't want your son to lead my life and the affairs of what I'm doing in this world today. You save me and you get me to heaven. That's the Savior part. Don't be my Lord. Now here's the issue. One of the reasons why life is such a struggle for you and I today, do I, do I submit to Jesus Christ and his divine kingdom or do I live my life following the devil and the world's kingdom? Is that God comes into our life 
and he sees how many other lords. Man, when you open that jigsaw puzzle, it's pretty easy to find all the boundary pieces. But then every other piece starts to look the same and you don't know where to start. You don't know which one to go first. I think Jesus Christ feels that way when he looks into our lives and he sees all these other pieces. Jesus Christ is not willing to be one of many. He has no desire to be part of an association or a club. The Bible says that he might have the preeminence. So the question to you today, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, is, is he your Savior? And you say, yes, amen. But now the more important question, is Jesus Christ your Lord? Folks, Jesus Christ died to be your Savior. He lives to be your Lord. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let me ask you a very simple question. And this is, again, a, a, a sermon kind of geared towards God's children today. But let me ask you here, those of you that know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, do you also confess Him as your Lord and King? Do you, uh, do you come to church on Sunday and sing the songs and give your offerings and hear the preaching and say amen and you're part of God's kingdom on Sunday, but then come Monday through Saturday, you're right back in the world's kingdom? Do you confess the Lord as much on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday as you do on Sunday? Jesus Christ makes it very clear here, and I cannot for the life of me imagine Jesus doing this, but I know he would because his word says it. If we deny him as our Lord, he will deny us as his children. God help that there would not be a one of them today that would, that would not be able to say he is my Savior and my Lord. How many of you by the upraised hand would say, Pastor, pray for me. I need to do a much better job making him Lord of my life and not just my Savior. Anybody like that? Just slip your hand up, Pastor, pray for me. He needs to be my Lord I see those hands. Thank you very much. Folks, think about this. The saving part for you as a child of God is already done when you accept Him as your Lord and Savior. That part's done. Never can change. You can never lose your salvation. But now Jesus Christ lives and He allows you to live so that He can be your Lord and so that He can guide you and direct you into the kind of person He wants you to be. And you may sit here and think, I don't want to give up the things of the world. Folks, I got news for you. Everything in God's kingdom is so far better than anything you can find in the world. Without question. Let me ask you, if you're here today and, and you do not you can't think of a time when you've asked the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and to save you. Maybe he's not even your savior yet. Well, I'd hate for you to walk out of this church and not know that you're a child of the king today and that heaven is your forever home. Jesus Christ died on the cross so that he might save you from your sins, from hell, give you eternal life in heaven. Is there anybody here? Just raise up your hand and say, Pastor, I'm not sure that Jesus Christ is my Savior. If he's not your Savior, he cannot be your Lord. Anybody just quietly raise up your hand, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not sure that I know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Crucial step. Just raise your hand. Don't want to don't embarrass you. just want to pray for you. Anybody like that? Well, then my question would be, It would, it would appear that everyone in here can say, Jesus Christ is my Savior. I hope that the same amount of us can say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. Heavenly Father, how I pray that you would have your will and way in this invitation.
God, what a shame it would be for us to take advantage of your son Jesus Christ and his willingness to die and be a sacrifice for our sins. And we accept that gift and we ask him to be our savior, but we don't want any part of him being Lord of our lives. Father, how I pray that not a one of us here would take advantage of your son Jesus Christ. Lord, I would pray that each and every person who is struggling with this today would find their way to an altar and say, Lord, I need for you to have your rightful, preeminent place in my life as Lord and King. God, have your will and way in this invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 544, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. 544. Let's stand, please. Have thy known way I'd like to introduce to you uh, Mr. Roy and Pam Sovas. They've been visiting our church.